Hi, I'm Mike Aquilina, and I've written a book for Paraclete Press called Work, Play, Love. And now the folks at Paraclete have asked me to speak a little bit about the work part of the book. So I'll begin this consideration at the beginning, when Christianity was very young. In fact, the church was hardly a hundred years old when a pagan intellectual named Celsus launched a vigorous attack against it. This religion couldn't be true, he said, because it was made up of shoemakers, cleaners, weavers, and other common laborers. Its God was a carpenter, for heaven's sake. His mother spun cloth, and his great spokesman was a tent maker. How could a religion made up of such lowly people be anything but contemptible? Celsus believed what every gentleman of the Greco-Roman world believed, that it was base and ignoble to do useful work with your hands. The French social historian Paul Vane speaks of the ancients' contempt for labor, their undisguised scorn for those who work with their hands, their exaltation of leisure as the sine qua non of a liberal life, the only life worthy of a man. And Vane's observation was hardly new. In the 19th century, his countryman, the historian Charles Schmidt, remarked that in classical antiquity, work was regarded as a hindrance to public life. It was despised as servile, degrading to man, making him incapable of virtue and blunting his intelligence. It was the lot of the slave. And it's true. Aristotle echoed the sentiments of Socrates, Xenophon, and Plato when he wrote, The perfection of the citizen cannot be predicated of the man who is merely free, but only of the man who is free from such necessary tasks as are performed by serfs, artisans, and manual laborers. No one who leads the life of a worker or laborer can practice virtue. Aristotle's contempt for work and workers, Schmidt observed, is foundational to his philosophic theory of social morality. There are labors, Aristotle said, with which a freeman cannot be occupied without degrading himself. Such are those which particularly require bodily strength. But for these labors, nature has created a special class of men. These special beings are those whom we subjugate in order that they may take bodily labor in our stead under the names of slaves or mercenaries. And again, Aristotle is hardly alone in this. We have already heard from Celsus, Xenophon, um, and, and, and others. I mean, Xenophon fondly recalls Socrates heaping scorn upon shoemakers, public criers, and tent makers. And more than half a millennium later, Plotinus held fast to that old orthodoxy. The mass of manual laborers, he observed, is a contemptible mob whose purpose is to produce objects needed by men of virtue. To the most refined men of the Greco-Roman world, leisure was a virtue, and work was its opposite. It was vicious. It was a vice. Yet Christians never looked at work that way. Celsus was right. The churches were full of laborers who worshipped a laborer and whose scriptures preserved not, not the arguments and syllogisms of philosophers, but the stories of how, how people got work done. Abel was a herdsman. Jacob leaned into a plow. Noah was a sailor. Peter and Andrew and James and John were fishermen. Paul was one of those odious tent makers scorned by Socrates. These men got dirty and sweaty every day. They, they did not belong to the nobility. They were not aristocrats. And so the tradition-minded Greeks and Romans could dismiss them as ignoble. The idea that ordinary labor had tremendous dignity the idea that ordinary work could be something divine. This set Christians apart from their neighbors. It was one of those crazy Christian ideas that scandalized the pagan world, like a crucified God or the finite containing the infinite. And Christians seemed to revel in every insult. 
You know, writing around the year 150, Justin Martyr writes like a boxer, leading with his chin as he heralds Jesus as the unremarkable carpenter. He appeared without comeliness, as the scriptures declared, and he was deemed a carpenter, for he was in the habit of working as a carpenter when among men, making plows and yokes. In this way, he taught the symbols of righteousness and an active life. Wow, that's revolutionary. By working with his hands, Jesus was teaching us the symbols of righteousness and an active life. Later fathers of the church did not hesitate to portray Jesus working at other trades, working beside Christians of their time. A generation after Justin, Clement of Alexandria wrote the great hymn of, of, of the church that cast Jesus as a tamer of wild horses. Wherever you were working, they seemed to say, Jesus was working with you. Indeed, he was working within you and through you. This was a radical notion. The gods of antiquity were projections of the upper classes, and the myths were narratives of the mischief of a leisured life. The mystery cults were open almost exclusively to the leisured classes and sometimes the military. You needed time and money to rehearse the doctrines and undergo the rites of those cults. But the Christian God was himself a carpenter, whose Father in heaven was always toiling away. Jesus told his opponents, My Father is working still, and I am working. The Christian preachers who trained new converts gave these converts a countercultural message. Clement of Alexandria, writing in the last years of the second century, in the 100s, reminded new converts that there was no need for them to quit their jobs, or even to dream of doing so. He said, tend to your farming if you're a farmer, but know God while you labor in the fields. Sail if navigation is your profession, but invoke always the celestial pilot. Was it in the military career that the knowledge of God first came to you? Well then, obey the commander who orders you to do just things. And such preaching was effective. It worked, and it converted people in every walk of life. Clement's contemporary Tertullian of Carthage boasted of the church's explosive growth in his day. We are but of yesterday, and we have filled every place among you. Cities, islands, fortresses, towns, marketplaces, the very camp, tribes, companies, palace, senate, forum. We have left nothing to you but the temples of your gods. And the new Christian faith led the faithful not to abandon their duties, but excel in them. Again, Tertullian made clear that this distinguished Christianity from other world religions. He wrote, we are not Indian Brahmins or gymnosophists who dwell in woods and exile themselves from ordinary human life. We do not forget the debt of gratitude we owe to God, our Lord and Creator. We reject no creature of His hands. So, we sojourn with you in the world, abjuring neither forum, nor shambles, nor bath, nor booth, nor workshop, nor inn, nor weekly market nor any other places of commerce. We sail with you and fight with you and till the ground with you. And in like manner, we unite with you in your transactions. Even in the various arts, we make public property of our works for your benefit. So we're not far into Christian history. We're still in the 100s. And already we see the effects of a revolution. In the world, Christians were as ubiquitous as God, and like their God, they were working still. While Plato, Aristotle, and Plotinus saw necessity as the bane of human life, Christians, like Origen of Alexandria, celebrated it as the engine of divine providence. He wrote, The want of necessities of human life led to the invention, on the one hand, of the art of husbandry, on the other, to that of the cultivation of the vine. Again, to the art of gardening and the arts of carpentry and blacksmithing. 
by means of which were formed the tools required for the arts that minister to the support of life. The want of covering introduced the art of weaving, which followed that of wool carding and spinning, and again that of house building, and thus the intelligence of men ascended even to the art of architecture. The want of necessities caused the products also of other places to be conveyed by means of the arts of sailing and piloting to those who were without them, so that even on that account one might admire the providence that made the rational being subject to want in a far higher degree than the irrational animals, and yet all with the view to his advantage. Though he's writing in response to a pagan opponent, Origen is positively exuberant about labor. He celebrates every legitimate form of work and even treats the need to work as a gift of a provident, fatherly God. And so it was from the beginning, and not only the beginning of the church, but even the beginning of creation. In the very first pages of the Bible, in fact, we learn that man was made in the divine image. Next, we learn that he was made to work, to have dominion over all the creatures of the earth and sea and sky. And he was told to fill the earth and subdue it. In the following chapter, we learn also that God placed man in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. So man was created in God's image with work as an elemental part of his nature. All of this happened before there was any talk of testing or disobedience or the consequences of sin. In the earthly paradise, long before there was sin, there was work and it was good. In fact, it was more than good. Work in the beginning was holy. We see this in the way the story is told. Adam is commanded to till the garden and keep it. Some translations say he must work it and guard it. The original Hebrew verbs are avodah and shamar, which are elsewhere in the Hebrew scriptures used to describe the work of priests as they tended the sacred rites in the temple and the tabernacle. With his creation, then, Adam was given a task, and that task was priestly. Well, the work of a priest is to offer sacrifice. That's what Melchizedek did. That's what Aaron did. That's what Zechariah did. So what was the stuff of Adam's sacrifice? What was he offering when there was no altar upon the earth? It seems that the entirety of the earth was his offering, and his work was the act of sacrifice. As God equipped Adam for the task of subduing the earth, he was also ordaining him for priestly service. And that moment, I believe, is the true Big Bang in any Christian understanding of work. The event remains like background radiation through all the rest of salvation history, informing the way labor and laborers are portrayed in the religion of Israel and how they're protected and regulated in Israel's law. The background radiation is evident also in the terminology used for the priestly cult. We see in the book of Exodus that it is described simply as service, using the same term employed to describe the slave labor that was done for Pharaoh. This implies that there was an ordinariness to the tasks of the priests, but it also suggests that there was something sacred about the tasks of brickmakers, bricklayers, and construction crews something sacred about what they did. Greek-speaking Jews preserved this linguistic connection as they called their sacred rites by the word liturgia, public work. We still keep the fire going today, whether we use that word's English e equivalent, liturgy, or whether we translate it into something more serviceable like service, church service. We were made for work, and God intended our work to be holy, 
That doesn't mean it will be easy. After Adam sins, God confronts him with the consequences of his action, and most of them affect his work. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you. And you shall eat the plants of the field in the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread till you return to the ground. Note that work is not a punishment for sin, nor is it a consequence of sin. Because of our sin, however, work is burdensome to us. It can be troublesome and frustrating. But from the beginning, it is good. It is holy. It is our sacrifice. And so it was in the life of Jesus, the new Adam. In his hidden life, he reconsecrated labor as he assisted St. Joseph in his workshop. In time, he took up the work of craftsmen, draftsmen, builders, teachers, doctors, and he restored it all to its original goodness as he lifted it up to his Father in heaven. He sailed with the fishermen, and he came even to the aid of the wine steward, bartender. <laughs> in all of the work he took up, he established a model for us. He earned the title that went with his trade. The people called him the carpenter, the craftsman, as if that was his name. In all of the work he took up, he applied himself with diligence, sacrificially. As an itinerant teacher, he labored to exhaustion. He traveled far and wide without a place to lay his head. And again, he earned the title that went with his trade. The people called him the rabbi, the teacher as if it was his name. As he worked to earn those titles, the early Christians gloried in them. They delighted when they shared them. And we see the symbols of all trades inscribed along with the names of Christians throughout the miles of burial chambers we find in the Roman catacombs. So Celsus and, For Celsus and Porphyry, they could mock us all they wanted. The fathers didn't care. And neither did their poor and working class congregations. They knew that Jesus had divinized them at the moment he saved them. They had become partakers of the divine nature, to use the phrase from the New Testament. They were the beneficiaries of the most marvelous exchange, his divinity for our humanity. Because they were baptized, those first Christians knew that they lived in abiding communion with God. His flesh was their flesh, and his blood coursed through their veins. They worked now not with a merely human power, but they endowed their work with divine value. Even Christian ascetics were urged to imitate Christ in their manual labors. The ideal monk, St. Basil wrote, is one whose prayer is augmented by his work, but whose work is done so that they may have something to distribute to those in need. So monks needed to work even harder than most folks. And St. Benedict, in time, made prayer and work to be the watchwords of his Western reform. And it was all work in that original sense. Benedict referred to the monastic liturgy as Opus Dei, God's work, in which the monks were called to take part. And yet it was their work, too. Still today, in the Western liturgy, we make an explicit offering of our labors as the work of human hands. We do not hesitate to put those works on the altars. The Second Vatican Council, in affirming the common priesthood, proclaimed that all of the la laity's ordinary work is placed on the altar with the bread and wine of the sacrifice. Listen to these words from the Council. For all their works, prayers, and apostolic endeavors, their ordinary married and family life, their daily occupations, their physical and mental relaxation, if carried out in the spirit, and even the hardships of life, if patiently borne, all these become spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Together with the offering of the Lord's body, 
they are most fittingly offered in the celebration of the Eucharist. Thus, as those everywhere who adore in holy activity, the laity consecrate the world itself to God. To pray, to work. That's what you and I were made for. And that's where we find our fulfillment. And this is a distinctively Christian, distinctively Catholic, distinctively Orthodox way of looking at work. The ancient heretics, after all, did not share our enthusiasm for earthly industry. For the Gnostics and for the Manichaeans, to work was to muck oneself up in the evil creation, to fall further into the trap of the wicked demiurge. Well, you and I know better than that. And we know better than to blow off our work or to denigrate work in general or to work with less than human excellence. No, we've been redeemed to work with divinized hands. We co-create with God. We perform our labors with a touch that's more efficacious than the touch King Midas had when he could just turn things to gold. It's not that we repair dishwashers or raise better crops or write more beautiful poetry than the pagans do. But it means that we place what we have, whatever it is, on the altar, and that changes everything. On the altar of the cross, even professional failure was transubstantiated into triumph. Well, I'd like to end this time with a word about my dad. Because if I know anything about work at all, I learned it from him. My earliest memories are of him coming home from work. I was his late in life baby. He and mom were 47 when I was born. So in those memories, I'm around three and he's around 50. My dad was a welder and he worked on heavy machinery for a mining operation. He worked long hours at his job and sometimes he had to travel to distant sites. Sometimes he came home late. And usually, he came home exhausted. When I think of him coming home, I think of two distinct aromas, anthracite coal and motor oil. Because that's what I smelled when he walked in the door. And I'll bet at those moments, there was not a soul in Pittston, Pennsylvania, who had done more to earn a nap. And I'll bet when he got home, he wanted nothing more than to collapse beneath the newspaper. But that's not what he did. The first thing he'd do was to go to the kitchen sink and scrub the motor oil and coal grime from his hands as best he could. And then he'd go into the living room and he'd join in whatever game I happened to be playing, my little three-year-old games. Our routine was consistent. We'd push the Tonka trucks back and forth. Or we'd stack the Lincoln logs, taking our turns and making our plans. And at a certain point in our game, I'd look over and I'd see my dad fast asleep on the floor with his arms outstretched. And that's my earliest memory. There he is, snoring on the floor with his arms outstretched. My earliest memory is of a man who worked and whose particular fragrance was coal dust and motor oil. My earliest memory is an image of a man whose work was sacrificial, someone who gave and gave and gave and kept on giving till he had nothing left. And when he had nothing left, he fell into the form of our God, whom I knew well, even at age three, from divine worship. In our churches, Jesus was held up cruciform before our astonished gaze. Even now, some 50 years later, whenever I read Jesus' words about laying down one's life, it's a vivid image for me. It's my dad in his work clothes, out cold on the floor of that little apartment 150 South Main Street in Pittston, Pennsylvania. That image is for me a holy icon of Jesus Christ, 
Christ the laborer, still scorned by the world, who knows happiness, though, and fulfillment, because he gives himself entirely in love, holding nothing back. My dad's blackened hands tell me much of what I need to know about work. Jesus worked with his hands, and so he bestowed the supreme dignity on human labor. For Christians who know union with Christ, labor is not merely good, it is holy. It's an imitation of Christ and a participation with God in the very act of creation. This is far more than a work ethic. It's a profound conversion of life. We've been created for this. We've been called for this. We're redeemed for this. We're employed for nothing less than this purpose. I thank you for spending this time with me. I hope you'll read more about this in my book that I've written for Paraclete Press called Work, Play, Love.